Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm still working on the lighting for this room, so hopefully the lighting works out pretty good for this. But I wanted to do a follow-up. Uh, the Lord put it on my heart, gave me an idea to try to explain liberty in its simplest form, okay? Using scripture, but I wanted to do some images. So, have your Bibles out. We're going to be turning to some of the scriptures. But if you have a separate piece of paper, you can pause the video, get a separate piece of paper, get a pen and everything. Because I'm going to draw something that you can draw and just say, show you what liberty is at its basic core. Okay, what true liberty is. Now, if you got your pen and pencil, draw yourself a big circle. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw two stick figures. Kind of like that. Okay. If you're a sister in Christ, you put yourself in there. If you're a uh, brother in Christ, put yourself in there. Now, um, just making sure that we can see it. I cleaned it a little bit. I'm doing some test runs. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, oops. Yes. We'll do two on the outside, All right? So when you got this diagram, we're going to keep pointing at this diagram. Now, this circle here is a boundary. It's a law, a written law that you cannot pass. If you pass it, there's consequences. If you cross it, I mean. It's a boundary. Now, um, we're going to talk about the most important part that we talked about a little bit over in the last study we did about liberty. Okay? How does one sin against liberty? Okay? There's two ways we're going to show in this study how you can sin against liberty, true sinning against liberty. Okay? One is the obvious one we're going to talk about right here. Telling somebody that there is a law that they have to obey, and if they don't, they're lost and on their way to hell. That's the first way and the main way that a people sin against liberty in these false religions. Okay. I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I guess I did put it in here. There's two types of laws as we're going to look into. There's God-ordained laws, God's law, and then we have man's law. And you look at a lot of these false religions. We talked about this on, um, what was it, Believing in Vain. We went over Jehovah's Witness. We went over Mormons. They make a lot of their own laws. It's not God ordaining those laws. It's man's laws controlling people saying if they don't keep these, they're lost and on the way to hell. You, can, you have to keep these to be saved and to keep from losing your salvation. It's, you're, it's constantly earning your salvation. Right? That's sinning against liberty. Now, as we go through here, we're going to say what... We're going to show some things where the Old Testament, what the law was, how you keep it, and what's the consequences of not keeping that law. And people are grabbing that law today trying to say that you have to keep it today in order to be saved. That's the first way you sin against liberty. Okay? And I want to go through, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 56, we'll go over this again when it comes to salvation. Just, just sum it up in its simplest form. Here's you. You're to stay in this circle. It's a command. It's a law. You go outside the circle, you lose your salvation. I'm using this in the simplest form. Okay? Or it could be this way. Do something, stay in the circle. Or I put these out here for the do's and the don'ts in the Bible. Don't go into the circle. If you go into that circle, you're lost and you lost your salvation. Okay? That's sinning against liberty. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In the Old Testament, the law of sin and death. Anybody went outside it, they're, they're worthy of hell. They can't go to heaven. Okay? Everybody is outside it. Okay. 
uh, the Old Testament sacrifices, it covered their sins, it didn't take them away. And that was the whole point for Abraham's bosom. Everybody in the Old Testament that had a perfect heart with the Lord went to Abraham's bosom. But the law of sin and death still applied to them, which is why they couldn't go to heaven. Okay? It took a certain event to make a way for us to go to heaven. Okay? Romans 8.2, if you want to turn to Romans 8.2. Let's talk just briefly this event. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay? It went from, you had to keep the law to be saved, to now, Jesus' blood paid for our sins. There's only one way to heaven, Jesus Christ. His death Burial and resurrection. How he died, his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer to show you that you're not ashamed and it's coming from the heart. And then you ask God to save you. He's the one that does the saving. Okay? Now I already said this, Old Testament, you're outside the circle. You, you break this law, this is how you're supposed to be perfect with the Lord. Stay in the circle. Here's the law, the boundary. Everybody's outside that circle. Everybody's sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. Okay? In the Old Testament, Jesus' blood was not shed. We talk about Abraham's bosom. New Testament, God's blood was shed, so now we have liberty. Okay? Now, we don't... Remember, I'm not talking about sin itself. Okay? We're not to sin that grace may abound. The liberty that I want to talk about in this specific, when it comes to salvation, please hear me out, we, saved sinners, are inside the circle now. Okay. The, God's blood covered us. God looks at us and sees the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The lost world that rejects Jesus Christ, they're outside the circle. Okay. Now, liberty here, in kind of a sense, I mean, if you want to correct me, you can try, but I was looking at this, and I was like, the liberty, God, because people always said, God... Uh, when it comes to elect, the elect, you mean God chooses who he wants to be saved and who he doesn't want to be saved? No, he's given us liberty. In the Old Testament, you didn't have a choice. You were all under the law of sin and death. Today, you have a choice. You can be under the law of sin and death, or you can be on the law of, um, of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, the law of God. You have a choice. That's what liberty is. Okay. Uh, but it has to be a written law in order for liberty to apply. In its simplest form. There's a boundary, a law that's written down that says you do not cross this. This is the law. How you keep it, here's the consequences. Today, if you want to keep the law, great. If you won't want to keep the law, that's fine. There's no longer any consequences. Okay. I just want to show throw salvation there, but that's what this study is for, is for us Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, okay? In the life of a Christian, what is liberty in the life of a Christian? I want to do this follow-up video because it still seems like people are getting it wrong, okay? First way you sin against liberty is telling somebody they have to keep a law that's written down, whether it's by man or by God, in order to be saved, the law of the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus is the only law you have to obey to be saved. The gospel, repentance, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the law of the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus, that's the only law you have to abide by to be saved. There is no liberty when it comes to that law. The liberty I was talking about is you have the law of sin and death, you have the law of the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. You have the liberty to choose. God doesn't force people to get saved. He doesn't keep people and prevent people from getting saved. That's what I was talking about when I was trying to say liberty. He's given you a free will, the free choice to choose which law you want to be under. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're going to talk about examples as a Christian, examples of real liberty. Okay? Liberty in its simplest form, I'll say it one more time. It has to be, there's got to be a law, a boundary, a law written down, stating, you have to do this. Or, like I said, do. You have to be in the circle. Do be, go into the circle. 
or don't go into the circle. There's a boundary you're not to cross. Mm -hmm. So the first one that we talked about before, but I just want to bring this stuff up again because I just want to reiterate it as best I can using this form. Mm -hmm. Circumcision. Genesis 17.10, if you want to turn to Genesis 17.10. We're going to talk about the law of circumcision. Right? Because it's actually a law that's written down. A lot of people like to grab things that aren't written down, they're not a law, and they try to claim we have liberty. And we're going to get to some of those. People misuse liberty. That's the second way. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the second way you sin against liberty. You misuse it. Okay. There's people out there that are sinning against liberty, and they're not saying you have to keep something to be saved. What they're trying to do is grab things and throw it under liberty, saying it's okay. They're hiding behind liberty. They're using liberty as an occasion for the flesh. Mm -hmm. So circumcision, uh, circumcision, Genesis 17, 10. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man, child, among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins. See, it talked about you have to be circumcised. That's the law. Then it's telling you how to be circumcised. And it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall circumcise among you, shall be circumcised among you, every man, child in your generation. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Okay, we're going to get to 14. I'm stopping it for a second. So we've got here, circumcision is a law. It tells you how to be circumcised. As a child, the eighth day. That's when the blood starts clotting and you can be circumcised. Okay? It tells you what circumcision is. Okay. Now, what's the consequences? of not being circumcised. Verse 14, And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. How do we apply that to today? If they're trying to grab the Old Testament and saying, you have to keep this law in order to be saved, because we're going to get to the New Testament where they were trying to tell Christians they had to keep this law, in order to be saved. So today, what does it mean? You're not a Christian if you're not circumcised. If you're trying to apply that to today. There's consequences. Now, this is a command of God. Remember, I want to reiterate it again. People almost, I had one person tell me, Brother Sister Christ, that the only laws that the only thing that's a sin is the written laws, the ten, the, the you know, the Ten Commandments. And I had to correct him and say, listen. They're called the Ten Commandments for a reason, because they're commands from God, do's and don'ts. Anything that's written in the Bible that's a command from God, and you disobey it, you know what that's called? Sin. Okay? When you go against God, that's called sin. <coughs> so I want to read, this is a law written by God, not man, God, that you had to follow in order to be God's pe people, chosen people. If you didn't do this, you weren't part of God's chosen people. All right. Now, if you want to turn to Galatians 2.1, let's talk about the New Testament here. Remember, at the point we're in now, there's a law. If you're circumcised, you're God's chosen people. If you're not circumcised, it says there that you're cut off from the people. You're no longer part of the people. You're cut off. Mm -hmm. Galatians 2.1 Galatians 2.1 Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took tithes with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because a false brethren unawares brought in, who came in pri privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we have place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Here's the example of true liberty. 
Old Testament, you're not to cross this line. New Testament, you can be here or here when it comes to circumcision. This is the, everything has specifics. This line doesn't crawl. You know what I'm saying? It's, we're talking about circumcision. Then we'll talk about something else. This line right now for what we're talking about is circumcision. You can be here or you can be here and you're still right with God. You now have liberty to choose whether you want to be circumcised or you don't want to be circumcised. That's what liberty means. And people keep taking it out of context, and we're going to talk about this, and they're misusing liberty. They're trying to apply the liberty to things that has nothing to do with liberty. Okay. Uh, Galatians 5.1, we must jump over to Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Remember, we just read in Galatians 2 where they're trying to bring it back into bondage. What's the bondage? You have to keep the law in order to be saved. You have to keep the commandments of God. You have to be in this circle in order to be saved. You're bringing back into the bondage of law of sin and death, which is out here. But they're saying you've got to keep this. If you have to be perfect before God and you have to be sinless before God, you're always going to be out here. If you think you can be sinless before God... Without Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ isn't enough, you're always going to be out here. Yeah. Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. See, they weren't coming in and saying, hey, you know, if you want... He's not, they're not coming in and saying, hey, if you want to be circumcised, fine. If you don't want to be circumcised, that's okay. You don't have to be, to be saved. Right? It's no longer a command that you have to do this. That's the Old Testament. Today, God has opened the boundary to where we have liberty. You can be on either side and still be right with the Lord. They weren't doing that. They were coming in saying, you have to be circumcised to be right with the Lord. Liberty, you can be on either side. That's what true liberty is. Okay? And remember, it has to be a written law. Whether it's a law, we're going to talk about this, a law that God has put down, or a law that man's trying to hold you accountable to in order to be saved. It's a salvation issue in the sense that liberty is when they try to turn something that's liberty into a salvation issue. Then they're sinning against liberty. Okay? But liberty means it's no longer a salvation issue. You get to choose. Verse 3, for I testify again to every is that, okay. again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. So here, now he's not talking about just this. Like I said, it wasn't just circumcision. It's that they were grabbing certain laws that they wanted and saying they had to be brought under all the laws. And you'll see that with people, okay? These false religions, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, we talked about them in our Believing in Vain video. Okay, they'll grab a few laws from the Bible and say, yes, yeah, see, the Bible, the Old Testament says we're to do this and we're to do that. But what do they do? They start sneaking in man's law. They start adding things that you won't even find in the Bible and saying these are laws you also have to keep. Okay? What they do is they grab one or two, they're supposed to be liberty, and then they try to hold them to all these laws. So now they're a whole debtor to the whole law. That's what Paul is saying. If you try to make one of these a salvation issue, then you're in debt to the whole law. All of them. If you've got to keep this one, you've got to keep them all. all right. Verse 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. What are we saved by? I know I can go back into a lot of these faith alone people. We're saved by our faith. What are we truly saved by? According to Scripture. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It says here that you have fallen from grace. Not that you lost salvation. If this is what you're saying that you have to do to be saved, you're not saved. You're, taught, you're teaching works. When we say you have to repent of your sins, they're trying to yoke it up with this. And that's not it at all. And they know it. They just love their sin, and they want to keep their sin. It's your attitude towards sin that changes. God bought you. You're purchased with the price. You're bought with the price. You're not your own. 
You belong to God. He tells you what to do and you do it. And here's a hard thing for th those faith alone people to understand. You're going to want to do what God tells you to do through His perfect written word. You're going to want to. I know this is a hard concept. Going off on a tangent a little bit. It's a hard concept, but you're going to want to do it. Okay? Turn to Romans chapter 2, verse 25. Okay? People trying to bring you back under the law. A written law that God has written down. Romans 2, 25. And then like I said, sometimes they'll throw in a lot all the time. When they try to bring you under one or two of the few of the laws that God has written and ordained in the Old Testament, they're going to try to bring in man-made ordained laws saying you have to keep those two to be saved. Kind of like a Nicolaitan hoarding over the laity, controlling them, and one of the ways they do it is with their own do's and don'ts. Mixed in with the Old Testament do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. Romans 2, 25. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the whole law. In the Old Testament, they weren't capable of keeping the old law, the whole law. Today, we're not capable of keeping the whole law. That's why we say there's lost sinners and there's saved sinners. We're still sinners. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Okay. The whole point of the law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, and that's what it's talking about here. You break the law, then your circumcision doesn't mean anything. Right? Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not this uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Remember the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, Judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outwardly in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. What are we reading here? They were trying to hold him to the law a physical thing, a work. And he's saying no. It's spiritual now. Spiritual circumcision. The physical circumcision, the law, ain't going to save you. Okay? Once again, there's a boundary there. I'm going to keep pointing to this. Hopefully you got your piece of paper. There's a boundary here. You're not to cross it in the Old Testament. Today, as a Christian, it, you have liberty. You, can go back and, you can't go back and forth with circumcision, but you can choose to be circumcised or not to be circumcised. That's the liberty. But there's an Old Testament law that we're now liberated from. There's a boundary that we're now liberated from. Now you can take the circle away and say you can be here or here. Okay? You have liberty. The uh, last verse we're going to talk about for circumcision, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, if you want to turn there next. Um, but like I said, I just don't want to have to keep erasing the circle. I'm still trying to get used to the chalkboard and some of the erasers aren't the best. But you take the circle away because now we have liberty. You can be here or you can be here. doesn't matter. You have liberty. Okay. Philippians 3.1 Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you. To me, indeed, it is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and having no confidence in the flesh. Nothing I can do can earn heaven. Nothing I can do can make me justified myself, by myself, to be justified before the Lord. Only Jesus Christ is justified before the Lord. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. But what thing were count to me, that, I, that those I counted lost for Christ. All the works, he counted lost for Christ. He needs Jesus Christ. This can't save him. Circumcision can't save him. Okay. Uh, in its simplest form, liberty. There's a line here you cannot cross. There's a boundary. You're not allowed to cross it. Now, the boundary is taken away, and you have liberty. 
You can be here, or you can be here. You're still in right standing with the Lord. You're still doing right. It's okay to be either side. Right. Now let's talk the next one, meats. Right. This is another one that the Bible does a big example of. This one, however, I'm going to have to draw another circle because there's still a boundary within a boundary. We're going to see this. We still have liberty, but that liberty is still limited. Okay. We're free from one boundary, but there's one boundary that hasn't been broken. Okay. Leviticus 11.1. I'm going to turn to Leviticus 11.1. We're going to read a long way because I really want to go through all this so we get this really in our heads and in our hearts. The Old Testament law, what it is, how to abide by it, and whatnot, and the consequences. Okay. Leviticus 11.1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, so that's what we, they can eat, nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, of them that defieth the hoof, or the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but defieth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And there, and they, okay, I'm sorry. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divided the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean unto you. Of the flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch, they are unclean to you. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the water, in the seas, and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. Adieu. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and the river, of all of that move in the waters, and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination to you. The don'ts. What you're allowed to eat in the water, what you're not allowed to eat in the water. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. And these are they which shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the off... I wonder if I pronounce that right. Ossifrate? I almost want to say osprey, but it's spelled differently. Maybe I did it. And the, no, then the osprey. That's the next one. I can't pronounce that one. <laughs> Sorry, brother and sister Christ. Sometimes I have a hard time. And the vulture, and the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl, and the night hawk, and the cuckoo, and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl, and the swan, and the pelican, and the geiger eagle, and the stork, the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat, all fowls that creep going upon all four shall be an abomination to you. Yet these May ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth forth on all four, which have legs above their feet, to leap withal upon the earth. Even these of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, and the ball, bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind, but all other flying, creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. And for these ye shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth the carcass of them shall be unclean until the evening. And whosoever beareth aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. That's talking about touching the carcasses. Okay. There's a law here, we just read it, of all the different things. The fowls, the creeping things, and meats. Okay. You're not to cross this. It's a law. You have to obey it. There's no liberty. This is Old Testament. So now today, you still have people today that are forbidding from eating meats. You have people saying you still can't eat certain meats. There's certain things you're not allowed to eat if you want to be right with the Lord. Is that how it is today? If you want to turn to Acts 10, uh, we're going to talk about Peter. Sorry. Um, I'm still learning to stand for long periods of time, so... Uh, we're going to talk about Peter, the vision God gave Peter, Acts 10.9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. 
And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open, and certain vessels descend upon him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. Remember what we just read in the Old Testament. It has everything in it. Before the Old Testament, some were okay, some weren't. This shows all of them. And look what it says. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Old Testament law, I'm pointing inside Old Testament law. And the voice spake unto him again. The second time, what God hath cleansed, that call now thou, not thou unclean, or not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessels and the vessel were received up again into heaven. I apologize, I forgot to make the wording bigger in my eyes, and I'm trying to read small print, I forgot to make it bigger. Old Testament law, Peter saying, no, 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 Old Testament law. God saying, no, taking that circle away, you have liberty. You can choose not to eat pork. Or you can choose, or choose not to eat pork, the Old Testament law, or you can choose to eat pork. You can choose not to eat certain of the fowls, now you can eat those. You can be either way. You have liberty, and that's what God was saying. Who ordains liberty? <laughs> Jesus Christ. God. Now, there's another boundary we need to talk about, so I don't need to do this real quick. And this, there is a boundary, okay? We can be on either side now. It's a choice. So I'm not going to really draw it for the sake of some of the other studies we're going to do. Draw yourself another circle around both. Okay? There's a boundary here where there's certain foods you're not supposed to eat. Now we can eat them. You can be on either side. But there's still another boundary that hasn't been broken. And people will try to use this for liberty. It doesn't apply to liberty. Okay? 1 Corinthians 8, 1. We're going to read all the way down to 12. Now, as touching things offered unto idols. That just pretty much gave it away. That's what this outer boundary, if you drew the circle, is. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Okay. Whether you choose to eat pork, or not to eat pork, or you choose to eat pork, there's a boundary that still hasn't been broken. You don't have liberty when it comes to this. Okay? Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. Uh, what happened to Paul? A uh, Peter, you know, we can eat anything we want. We all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. I can do whatever I want when it comes to food. But charity edifieth. Okay? If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. Jesus is everything. You get saved, brothers and sisters in Christ, it becomes 100% about Jesus Christ, not about this world. An idol in this world is nothing. We that are saved know this. Amen. And that there is none other God but one. Okay. Trinitarians, you just lost. None other God but one. Not three lesser gods that make up a big capital G God. The God that teaches that there's only one God. Okay. Verse 5. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, the idols, as there be gods many and lords, lowercase l, lords, many. Do we have a lot of false gods today? A lot of counterfeit Jesuses and just flat out false gods? Yes. But to us there is but one God, capital G God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him. And one capital L, Lord, Jesus Christ, for whom are all things, and we by Him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto idols. Mm -hmm. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better... Neither if we eat are we the worse. We go back to these, this part. We know this new boundary, this is not a new boundary, but this boundary right here hasn't been broken. If it's offered unto idols, you're not to eat it. But the food itself, neither whether we eat not, or don't eat it, or whether we eat it, 
Okay. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Okay. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge set at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the con conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered unto idols? We talked about this in the, in the other study about give me liberty or give me death. Um, talking about how uh, you can cause another brother and sister in Christ to stumble. When it, uh, you can, uh, liberty can offend somebody, even though you have liberty, you can offend somebody the wrong way. Your liberty can offend somebody in two ways, in a good way or a bad way. Right? And if it's a bad way, then you're misusing liberty. And though thy knowledge shall be weak, and though, and through, sorry, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died, but when ye sin against, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Yeah. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Like I said, I, I won't go into it that much. I went into it a lot in the other one. But bottom line, if something that you have liberty in is causing another brother or sister in Christ to stumble, I'll have nothing to do with it. Even though I have liberty, I won't do it. Okay. Biggest example I used in the other study was alcohol. Are you allowed to have a glass of wine? Yes. But so many brothers and sisters in Christ today have amazing testimonies where God got them away from alcohol and everything because they were alcoholics and lost life. And they, they had a hard time with it when they were newly saved and God got it out of their life. And it's just in abundance today. I just won't mess with alcohol, period. Right. Why? Because if alcohol make my brother to offend, I'll drink no alcohol while the world standeth. New heaven and new earth? That's a different story. Okay. 1 Timothy 4.1, if you want to start turning there. The reason I read that is because there's still this boundary right here. We're not to cross it. Sometimes you'll eat food, and we're going to read this. You'll eat food not knowing. If you're not knowing that it's offered unto idols, God's not going to hold you uh, uh, responsible for it. Accountable. Okay? But the moment you know it's offered unto idols, are you supposed to eat it? But we have liberty. You'll see this a lot with people. There's still a boundary that hasn't changed. But they'll ignore that boundary and just say, we have liberty. We can do whatever we want. That's not always the case. Okay. So, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. We just read about conscience. Okay. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. We just read about Paul. What I've made clean, or uh, what I've made, or what God hath cleansed, that call not, call not common. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go back a little. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Paul, or Peter, I'm sorry, word of God says they're clean animals, you can eat them now. Okay. Prayer, we give God thanks for our food. I pray, brother, sister in Christ, you're giving God thanks for your food. But you sit down at a, a neighbor's house, a friend's house, a family member's house that's lost, and they're sitting there and they get up and go... I praise Buddha, and I want to give Buddha thanks for this food, and, and we eat this food, and offering in name of Buddha. Guess what? You're not allowed to eat the food, brothers and sisters in Christ. That food is now offered unto idols. I'm using this as extreme. You hardly ever, you go to that person's house, they don't say anything, everybody just sets and eat. God doesn't hold you accountable. But you see them stand up and start saying, are they giving God thanks? then that food isn't clean anymore. The moment they offer that food to a, a false idol, you're still within this boundary, the big circle. This smaller circle boundary has been broken. You have liberty when it comes to here, but you don't have full liberty when it comes to food. There's still a rule law out there. If it's offered unto idols, you're not to eat it, and that hasn't changed. There's no wiggle room. You know it's offered unto idols, you don't eat it. I've mentioned this before, I don't really go out to eat that much anymore because 
brothers and sisters in Christ, what I've been struggling with with the brothers and sisters in Christ is there's people who want to go around like this. They don't care. They don't want to see the truth in certain areas. They love their sin. They love what they're doing. They don't want to be convicted by it, so they go like this. And what I'm about to talk about is restaurants. A lot of the restaurants I've been going to, I've been starting to get convicted. I haven't been going to a lot, but I go when I visit family. Family comes here. I just I like cooking my own food. And for some reason, I just have one of those families that they really don't like to eat home-cooked food anymore. They just, they, when we get together, they want to go out to eat. But me personally, I don't go out to eat hard anymore. A, I like to eat healthier, but B, Mexican restaurants, you see the sun. You look at the Aztecs, it's all about Aztecs, and they've got the sun with the eyes and the smile, and you look into it, that's a false god. A sun god. What are you doing when you're going to that Mexican restaurant and eating food? You're eating food offered unto idols. That whole restaurant is designed for the Aztec look and come here to get our food that we make and it's authentic. Can you eat Mexican food? You have liberty. Absolutely. I, um, my neighbor's mother's, I guess his mother-in-law, so that's the way to say it. She makes, um, gosh, I can't remember the name of them. She makes some Mexican food and she sells it on the side. So every once in a while I'll buy some from them. It's homemade, it's authentic, it's not offered to any gods. It's brought over here, I'll melt some cheese on it. I can do it. You have liberty. But I can't go into that restaurant anymore because the false god. It's off, food's offered unto idols. What about uh, Chinese and Japanese restaurants? I went into a Japanese restaurant and it really convicted me. They had a Buddha up on the desk where you go to pay for your food. And they, had, they put money on the Buddha and you rub its belly and everything. Money from different uh, parts of the world and everything. What are you doing when you pay for food and there's Buddha sitting right there? You're eating and paying for food offered unto idols. Are you supposed to be eating that food? No. This boundary is still here. Now, can you make some food, uh, Chinese and Japanese style food of your own? Absolutely. I make a poor man's um, egg drop soup. You know, I take top ramen. I know some people say it's kind of not that good, but it's, well, I need to save money because I got this hillside out there that I had a guy come look at it and he said, yeah, it needs to be done. That, my deck is starting to lean and whatnot, and it's just I'm struggling right now. I, I'll do a walk and talk um, tomorrow and explain some of the things I've been going through this week financially and physically and spiritually. So, um, but, uh, and I had to make some surprise trips, but bottom line, uh, I, I do a poor man's soup some, a lot. I like it, you know. I will boil water, I'll break a few eggs, drop some eggs in there, you mix them up a little bit, and you slowly pour it in as it's boiling water, and I call it my own egg drop soup. And I'll do the noodles, I'll do the uh, chicken broth, the best thing to do it in, and you don't have to use the packet, because you know, the packet's got some bad stuff in it. Sometimes I do use the packet. But I make my own uh, version of egg drop soup, and you can put some of the uh, vegetables that they do. Uh, can I do that? Yes. We have liberty. You can eat anything, or you can choose not to eat things. Okay. Notice one thing I throw in there too, it's got to be healthy. There's things you don't eat that's not healthy. One thing I didn't put on here, the, other, the boundary here is offered unto idols, but another boundary that could be thrown on here that hasn't been broken is that your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost and it's to be without blemish. You're supposed to eat right. You're supposed to eat healthy. And you can eat healthy eating all the different meats, depends on how it's cooked. You can eat healthy eating all these kind of vegetables, depending on how they're grown and how they're cooked. You know what I'm saying? That could be a boundary also because that hasn't changed. But the whole point of me drawing this other circle is um, sometimes there's more than one boundary. And we're given liberty on one boundary, but there's still another boundary we're not supposed to cross. All right. So, I have to draw it again, I will, but I just want to get this, because that was one of the big ones, that the biggest example of there being, there was two, oops, there was two boundaries. All right. You weren't allowed to eat certain foods, and you're not allowed to eat food offered unto idols. One boundary is still there. Liberty doesn't apply. 
Okay. When it comes to eating food offered to idols and you're supposed to eat healthy, your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. We'll get to our third example. I just picked three examples. Um, and then I went and grabbed what is it? Uh, a few examples of false liberty. So this is our last example, and there's a lot of them in there where they're trying to pull them back into the law, but we'll talk about the days. Okay? One thing I want to talk about is there's two types of days. And people need to get that down. Some of them, brethren, are still teaching falsely, and they can't seem to get it down. There's a man-made observance day. What do we call that? A man-made day. A man-ordained day that you have to keep. We call those holidays. Okay? You won't find the word holiday in the Bible. Okay? Observance of a day. Okay, God will say you're to observe this day, and this is why. Okay? God-ordained. Right. The Bible, we're going to get into it. Um, yes, we'll do this real quick. We'll see what God calls those days that He says you're supposed to keep. Does He call them holidays, man-made days, or God-ordained days? Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, I came across this and was like, it's interesting. I, I understand holiday. I'm not trying to be a big thing. Remember, True liberty means you have to keep it to be saved. There's a law and there's a boundary that you can't cross. Now, true liberty, what the Bible teaches is true liberty. Now you can be on either side. Another great, I'm going to stop for another great example. I didn't write this down. I talked about it in the other video for having a secondary circle because somebody will grab P, uh, Paul when he was set at liberty. There's a law saying he had to stay with the soldiers. It's a law. Written down law, or you know, man, it's man-made law, but it was still a law. They couldn't cross that line, but they were given liberty. They were allowed to cross the line, and he, uh, Paul was able to stay with some people. But there was still a bigger line here, bigger circle. He was still a prisoner. He wasn't allowed to go free. He was still a prisoner. Okay, but there was still a law that he wasn't supposed to cross, and they allowed him to cross it. That's called liberty. Liberty. They were giving him liberty because they didn't give everybody that liberty. They just gave it to him for that situation. They might have done it for other people, but for a general rule, it wasn't used. It was a law. They stay prisoner. They stay chained up. They stay with the soldiers. Okay. So that'd be another example that I talked about in the old uh, in the video of give me liberty or give me death because that's what this is all about. Liberty in its simplest form. There's a law written down that you can't break, you cannot cross. You do, you lose your salvation. Today, we're under the law of life, with the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. There are certain things where God said, you know what? You now have liberty. I'm taking away that circle. You have liberty. You can be here, or you can be here. But it has to be a law that's been written down. Okay? A lot of people come here to the United States thinking, well, I want to have liberty, I want to have liberty, I want to be free from the harsh laws of the country I'm coming from. The tyranny, they call it, from the countries they're coming from. They want freedom, they want liberty, they want to be liberated from those laws. They're still written laws. Okay? They're man-made laws, but you understand what I'm saying. All right? We're talking about the Sabbath day, getting back to this, okay, remember... Um, when it's God ordained, it's an observance of a day. God says you're to keep this day. You're to keep such and such. And it's, a, and it's based off of the day. Okay? Man-made ordained, they call it a holiday. All holidays are man-made. Okay? And you're going to see that. We're going to talk about this. Okay? When we get to false liberty, people who sin against liberty trying to claim this falls under liberty, and it doesn't. Okay? Right. Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, okay. which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. I just wanted to finish that there. But holy day, it doesn't say holiday, it says holy day. For something to be holy, it has to be God-ordained. Now what false religion do we know that claims that they're God, and they make things holy day. Well, you got the Catholics, you got all its, the, uh, the mother of harlots, the daughter of the whore, you know. 
Um, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, nowadays it's all these religions, uh, even ba so-called Baptists today, they're all part of the Catholic system. They've all gone the way of Rome. And the Rome, it's like they try to say, this is ordained, this is Saint so-and-so's day, you know? It's a holy day. It's man-ordained, it's not God-ordained. There's a difference. If it's God-ordained, chapter and verse. Well, it's not just a holiday, it's, it's a Christian holiday. Chapter and verse, where God has ordained it, saying, you're supposed to keep it. Today, we're going to read here real quick, we have liberty. But it still has to be something that God liberated us from. A boundary. That God said, okay, I'm taking down that boundary. You have liberty now. All right. Sabbath days. So we just read there. Holy days. Sabbath days. All right. Exodus 28. Let's go back to Exodus 28. And we're going to talk about what the Sabbath day is and why it was ordained and who ordained it. All right. Exodus 28. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. God speaking. Six days shalt thou labor and do all work. It's God's command. Okay, he's the one commanding this. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Okay. It's God's command that Moses is speaking to him. And in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter. Let's see. Thy may maid servant manservants nor thy maidservants nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates from the sixth day the lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is then in is and rested in the seventh day wherefore the lord blessed the sabbath day and hallowed it what's the sabbath day it's a day of rest who ordained it god ordained it why on the seventh day, on the creation, back in Genesis, what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. Okay? That's a command in the Old Testament. There was a boundary. There was a law. You don't cross it. You keep the Sabbath. What was the consequence for not keeping the Sabbath? Okay? Turn to Numbers 15.32, a good example. What was the consequences? Okay. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathered, gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. And they decided what happened to him. No, I, I know I'm being sarcastic. I had to throw that in there because people need to read. This is all about God. Okay? God ordained. God says it. He states it. It's his command. And they put him in war because it was not declared what should be done unto him. People didn't know what to do to him. Right? They were just told not to do it. It's a command from God. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. I keep pushing this in, and I keep pushing this in, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a boundary, there's a law. You're not to cross it. There's consequences. What does liberty mean? We are now free from those consequences, and we can choose. It has to be a law, and there has to be a consequence for liberty to apply. For say, okay, now the consequences are gone. That wall, that circle is taken down. Okay. So what was the consequences? The guy was stoned to death. Turn to Romans 14.5. What was going on in the New Testament? Pardon me. Um, they were trying to say that you have to keep the law in order to be saved. They came, we're going to read in the New Testament where they're trying to say, okay, you see this wall, the circle? It's a wall. You're not supposed to... We're going to try to draw the circle back in and make the wall back there. We're going to take away the liberty and say you have to keep it. So let's read Romans 14.5. Okay? This gets taken out of context a lot. Because what, what do people use it for? They try to use it for holidays. And it doesn't apply to holidays. Okay? Romans 14.5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. Holy day. Not holiday. Holy day. Okay. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. Okay. 
He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Old Testament law, holy day, the Sabbath. You want to keep it and honor God that way? Go for it. If I don't want to keep it and I'm still honoring God, that's fine. Right? It's not talking about man-made holidays. And people will grab this and say, see, I have liberty. It, one man esteemeth one day above another, one man esteemeth every day above No. It's talking about holy days. Okay? God ordained days that you do to serve God and worship God. Okay? But they'll still try to grab that and say, well, I can celebrate Mother's Day. Chapter and verse, where the law is, there's a boundary and there's a consequence if you don't, serve, if you don't do Mother's Day. And now that boundary has been taken down and we have liberty. Where is it written? It's not there. Turn to Colossians 2.16. Okay? And we'll finish up part one and we'll start part two. Um, Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holiday, of the new moon, or of the Sabbath day, which are shadows of things to come. The body of, is of Christ. We talked about this one. I just wanted to reiterate it again, okay? After we read about uh, one man esteemeth one day above another, one man esteemeth every day alike, is it talking about man-made holidays? No. It's talking about holy days. The Sabbath day, okay? In order for you to have liberty... You have to be liberated, I know this is hard for some people, liberated from a law that's in place that says you are to do this or you're not to do this, and here's the consequences. You're liberated from the consequences, and that liberty, you have freedom to choose. That wall gets taken down. That's liberty in its simplest form. I can't make it any more simple than this. The circle is the law. You erase this circle and you take the circle away, there's no consequences anymore. You have liberty to choose whether you want to be here or here. And people keep making it complicated. People keep twisting it. They keep sinning against liberty. Part two, we're going to go over false liberty. First way people are sinning against liberty is they're trying to say you have to do it to be saved. You have to keep the laws that God has said now you have liberty. Not that I said I've had liberty, or man says you have liberty, God says you have liberty. Okay? It's got to be a law that's written down, and there's got to be consequences, and you're being liberated from those consequences, and you're given liberty, it's freedom to choose. Okay? So that ends part one, we're going to move over to part two, where we're going to talk about people who misuse sin against liberty when they go to misuse liberty. Okay? Okay. So, uh, just getting a little tired. So, we're going to go into part two. So.